So this brings me, IETF brings me to our first uh, uh, first speaker. I'm very proud to uh, to announce Yari Arko. I guess everybody in this room knows him. He's a senior uh, senior expert in uh, Ericsson, but uh, he has been area director of the int internet area in the IETF. He has been IETF chair. He is on the IETF architecture board, and most importantly. You were one of the early adopters of the IoT, building your house with all kinds of uh, equipment, if, I'm, if I read this correctly on the web. So, Yari, please, uh, it's your stage. Do you prefer um, this or that? All right, uh, good morning and thank you for having me here. Um, and also, for those of you who are not local, welcome to Finland. And uh, I wanted to talk about uh, internet uh, security and security for the Internet of Things, um, and some threats that we, uh, we need to handle better than we have, have done so far. And um, so I'm, I'm going to go through just a little bit of personal background, just to, because I see uh, some faces that I, I have not seen before, just to let you know what kinds of things I'm interested in. Um, then talk about internet security, how that has developed, or internet in, in general actually also a little bit. Um, talk about some motivation why the things that we have been very focused on in recent years may not actually be enough. We need to do more. Uh, provide some examples of that and then talk about uh, what can we actually do. And uh, in particular, talk about what can we do for IoT systems and what could the Riot community perhaps do. Not that I'm, I'm sort of giving you a, um, a, a specific thing that needs to be done, but but uh, the community needs to figure out like what, how can we address some of these, these issues in the best possible way. The first step is understanding that we have some issues. Okay, um, start with, um, I just wanted to sort of uh, provide some information on the kinds of things that I'm, I'm interested in and the kinds of work that I've been doing. Um, many different topics, um, mostly around the internet currently, uh, focusing on internet evolution and how that uh, inter interacts with uh, 5G and mobile networks. That's, that's my main work at, at Ericsson. I, I'm based in the Ericsson office here in Finland. We have a research lab and a development center. Uh, roughly, uh, I think it's 900 people, uh, 50 in research, uh, 20 minutes drive to the west. Um, and um, I, I also have been working on, on IoT, maybe sort of uh, if you look at uh, sort of time-wise, uh, in the early 2000s, I, I, I worked quite a bit with uh, um, sensor networking. I worked with uh, smart homes in, in various different ways in terms of uh, uh, homes with lots of sensors and capabilities to, to, to react to things, um, but also in terms of home networks, how, how could you make them uh, as easy, configurable as possible and, and uh, uh, more, more general than they are today. Uh, from that, we had a few, a few interesting other uh, sidetracks. I went from smart homes to building smart igloos, um, to instrument igloos on you know, how cold it is and, and so on. Unfortunately, that business melted away pretty quickly. Um, I also worked with uh, user interfaces, and that, that was sort of like I've, I've never been like you know hardcore look at some particular thing very deeply, but more like you know put things together, like put the IoT system together with some kind of user interface and get some experiences on what types of user interfaces are actually working well. So um, as, as part of that, in the early 2000s also, I had this uh, Facebook friends, uh, like my laundry, and would tell me when it's dry. Um, you know, um, it, that actually turned out to be a pretty useful it, it, type of user interface, at least more useful than you know, going to some something and, and checking what the status is. Um, more recently, I've been working on more on the network side, so um, I'm not currently hacking too many IoT devices except for maybe hobby purposes. Um, so I've been working with 5G, I'm building some early prototypes. The 5G is, you know, there's obviously a very different radio, much, much uh, faster radio, but also the network aspects are quite different from past generations of, of systems, more internet protocol based actually. And uh, I've been prototyping some of those things. Um, and also, um, the uh, the internet keeps uh, changing quite a bit. Uh, one of the changes is in the transport uh, protocol space. Uh, the quick protocol has been sort of a hot topic uh, 
and I've been working around that in, in some, some fashion points of trying to make measurements in this um, world that is more, more encrypted than it was, was before. I'll talk about some of the details of that in a, in a bit. Um, but on the substance um, of, of this talk, um, so I wanted to go through like, you know, what's happening with the internet, what's happening with the internet security, and then talk about some things that are missing or that we should be paying more attention to. And um, I, I guess the big picture view, at least from my perspective, is that the evolution has been speeding up recently quite a bit. That I, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't believe that we could ever replace TCP essentially because it would be just uh, too difficult. But, but now it seems uh, quite doable, it's in, 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 in some ways in progress. Um, so, you know, we've seen some generally slow evolution, but now things seem to be moving faster. And why is that? Well, bunch of reasons, of course. Uh, one reason is that there are like this market situations when you have bigger players that might in some cases be in control of, you know, both sides of communication. Let's say Google is, you know, has a big market share in, in the clients and has a big market share in, in content. So it's relatively easy to, for them to make a change and, and change some communication, for instance. Um, so we've seen that. Um, we've also seen, obviously, some new needs. Um, the, 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 the situations evolve, and, and we have some things that we need to do. Uh, one example of that is that we realized at some point that ah, this um, pervasive surveillance that governments and surveillance organizations are doing is actually very, very widespread and uh, um, needs to be acted on. And the Snowden revelations from 2013 uh, basically told us that. And that has, in part, led to um, changes, um, taking security much more seriously and uh, understanding that the, the, there are threats in the internet that we did not fully understand previously. It's also interesting that as some of these changes are happening, it's also going to mean that there will be more changes going forward or faster, cha even faster changes in the, in the future. So, for instance, uh, Quick is uh, a protocol that typically is implemented in, in user space, and which means that um, go going forward, if you update something, let's say consistent control or whatever, then it, it will be able to do that as an update of application rather than kernel, which um, should make things uh, easier deployed and faster deployed. Somewhat scary, of course, also, because you, know, you could uh, introduce also bad changes, potentially, by accident or just because you want to go faster than some other people and so on. Um, so we've seen uh, changes in the way that security is deployed. I'll talk about that in a more detail in a, in a bit. Uh, we've seen new web protocols. Uh, we've seen new transport protocols. And there are tons of implications of these changes. Um, obviously, improved communication security is one. That's great. Um, but also, like, availability of information has changed. Like, what parties in the network or in the ecosystem know about what stuff has changed, and there's been also some new entities that have access to different information sources that, that were, were available before. Um, and as mentioned, like this evolution may continue in the future, so we, my prediction, we will see potential further evolution in various kinds of things, whether it's uh, in uh, naming systems or consistent control or, or maybe IoT. Um, that that um, seems far more doable uh, going forward than, than it was previously. Um, then let's go more in, into more detail about the encryption um, aspects. So we have today uh, much more increased use of encryption in the internet. I, I believe, at least in Ericsson customer networks, we went basically from like uh, 15 to 20 percent to 80 to 100 percent, depending on a little bit like what type of network it is and what country and so forth. But but it's a dramatic change. Um, and the reasons for this is obviously, you know, to begin with, there's some real security issues. Like if you don't protect your communication, somebody is, you know, could hijack your uh, accounts and uh, attack your applications and so forth. And that's bad. So, so that's what that's one reason. Um, the other reason is, of course, the Snowden revelations and the realization that there are these surveillance actions going on. Um, but we also had technology and infrastructure enablers that, that ma made these changes possible. 
um, you know, some improvements in protocols and implementations, like you know, make it a little bit easier, amortize the cost of you know, opening a security connection over many things, and then the security is not such a big burden anymore. Um, I also want to mention Let's Encrypt, which is the, 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 the system that allows you to take certificates very easily and for no cost um, that many of us probably use. I, I do use it, for instance. Uh, and of course, there's also business incentives, like, uh, you know, I, I, as a business of, you know, some internet thing, I want to be in full control, make sure that nobody interferes with the end user experience. Um, and that's fair. And so, um, as a result of this, there's been much more use of encryption, particularly on the web traffic, but also a few other things like server-to-server uh, -server email traffic. I don't have a good statistic of that, but it's, it's fairly high as well. Mm. I seem to recall a number of 50%, but maybe I'm, I misremember in some, some uh, popular servers. And uh, also some technology adoption. Uh, HTTP2 and, and, and so on, for instance, or QUIC. And, um, and that's great, this happened, um, but it's not the end of the trend. So you would think that, oh, okay, now we are 100%, like what's, you know, or we are 80% and we are, you know, inching towards 100 in, in a year or two. Um, it does not end there because, like, well, we basically meant when, you know, we have encrypted traffic, has stood for content encryption, now we en encrypted the content. But if you look at the details, there's a lot of information still available um, to outside parties to uh, mess with, or at least to get information from. Um, some examples, transport headers, lots of control information there. Uh, TLS setup uh, tells you where, where you're going, and tells the domain name uh, with, with something called server name indication, SNI, uh, and obviously DNS queries. And there are protocols in existence or efforts underway to define these protocols to, to make you know, basically all of this information uh, more hidden. Um, so QUIC, for instance, encrypts transport header information, unlike TCP. Uh, encrypted SNI encrypts the SNI information in TLS, and uh, DNS over HTTPS encrypts uh, uh, DNS query inf information. Um, and this is actually, for, for a lot of reasons, like unless you are the surveillance organization who actually want the content of traffic, then the, the impacts of this encryption chains are only coming because of these control pieces rather than the, the earlier um, thing that, that, that you encrypted um, the actual content. Um, so basically it will be harder or perhaps impossible to determine what traffic actually is going through your network. Um, it will, it, even with the encryption on, it has been s somewhat straightforward still for, for a number of years um, because of things like SNI. Uh, technologies such as deep packet inspection will be less useful, obviously, but also also things like SDN, like the you know the idea that we'll you know uh, develop a bunch of filters and uh, rules and uh, you know for this traffic do this and. Uh, well, you know, if you see the HTTPS port and traffic that goes to Amazon, what will you do? Like I had this experience in my home network because I have multiple uplinks. I wanted to, you know, uh, divide the load between the uplinks. And so let's, let's make Netflix go up this way and everything else that way. And of course, I found that Netflix is actually provided by Amazon and as is pretty much everything else. So it's very hard for me to figure out uh, what is what, and so I can actually make my filter in, in my home network. I, I predict that the same difficulties will apply to many of these other other things that you try to apply, like DPI or, or SDN. Also, debugging and measurements could be harder. Um, Quick is an interesting case. Uh, uh, Lars Eggert, where are you? I can't see you. Um, there you are. Um, uh, he, he's uh, chairing the, the quick working group at the ITF, and, and the working group has defined some ways of providing some amount of measurement-related information to outsiders uh, in order to allow like uh, network debugging and uh, measurement of performance of, of networks. And that's, uh, that's one counter example where 
even with encryption, one one can still do some some things. But but in general, like most of the things that one could do, are are, are no no longer easily possible. Then IoT. Do we have any IoT security problems? Heard of them? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't need to lecture you about this, but uh, it's just sort of categorizing a little bit, like what's what's going on. I, and and I guess the high level bit is that this is a business critical thing. Like we, as the parties in, if you were the Riot ecosystem, or we are, you know, Ericsson, a network provider, and many other companies, we need to fix this because. You know, this is sort of a reputation issue that we need to be able to provide, you know, reasonable security on on these systems and uh, reduce the the incidence of attacks and uh, reduce the risk of um, data leaks and so forth. Um, so it's it, it's it's really really essential. It's not just like oh, there's attacks, but but it's a business critical thing for us to keep under control. And um, so some of the things that are happening, like obviously you have, we've seen like hijacked IoT systems that you can make them do some things. Uh, you, you've seen uh, privacy issues and data leaks of various sorts. Uh, there's been concerns, of course, about uh, attacks on safety critical systems. Um, like the cheap example here is, is one, one example of that, a car um, system being attacked by outsiders. <laughs> That's not good. Um, and also, interestingly, the IoT devices are sometimes used as an attack vector against others. Like uh, in 2016, the uh, Dyn attack um, was largely IoT devices uh, dosing uh, uh, a network provider who was providing DNS services for some, some popular services, and then uh, those popular services went down for a moment at least. So that's not good either. There's also, um, I would classify these as security problems um, that you have, like, well, there's you know, actual criminals and attacks, then there's accidents, but there's also cases where there's like interest misalignment between parties. Like, there's been cases where the manufacturers have, you know, full control, full cryptographic control of a device, even though you bought the device for X hundred uh, dollars, um, but somebody else has the full full control of the device, and they can decide to do things like end of life the device, which is you know and not a nice thing either. So, just want you to realize that there. I mean, it's not all just uh, us against attackers, but it's also a little bit interest misalignments in some cases. And the security is kind of at the heart of that because you know who, who controls is is the question. And why is this? Uh, why do we have so many <coughs> issues in internet security? There's a bunch of reasons, um, some here on this slide. Uh, some technical reasons and some other economics-related reasons, for instance. Um, on the technical side, some of these problems are really hard, like uh, the configuration and initial pairing of uh, devices, or security configuration and initial pairing of devices is, is very hard particularly because you have like many devices and uh, you have no UI and, and, and so on. And, um, and people have been, of course, working on these problems. There are some, some solutions. Uh, Michael Richardson, where are you? Um, there you are. <laughs> um, you've been working on Brewski, which is one, one, one solution in, in, in this initial configuration steps. Um, and also, of course, you, you know this very well, like you're trying to do something that fits a small device. The technical implementation of some of these security mechanisms can be challenging because not much uh, memory or CPU power and so forth. And also, not just that, but you also have this imbalance between like what you can do and what a more powerful computer can do. So it's very difficult for you to compete in, in power, which means that if you know attacker runs on powerful computer and you run your, your little thing, um, you're, you're not equal, so you have to do your design very very carefully. Um, which you know, also rules out lo lots of interesting technologies like uh, puzzles and so forth. Um, there also seems to be a lot of uh, mindset still, unfortunately for this, you know, this is a trusted closed network. Um, you know, we are in a factory setting and this is our network and we control it and we have a firewall. Therefore, um, there's no no issue with security, that's not right at all. I mean, that's just uh, you know not not from 2019. That's not not gonna fly. 
Unfortunately, you have to secure your, your things because they, in every network, even the closed one, there will be uh, compromised parties. And uh, also, there's uh, involvement of, uh, I mean, we, in, in most systems, you need like third parties for some purpose. And they're very helpful. They're absolutely necessary, in fact, in, in many cases. But they're not always reliable for, for everything. So, so that, that's a, a problem as well. Not sure if that's a technical or, or otherwise. Um, and then on the other problems, uh, economics seem to drive like a short, very short uh, development cycle. So we, we all know this. Um, like you just have to put it out in the market, and then you know stock price will go up and sales will increase, and everyone is happy. And then you have to work on the next thing already. There's no time to make like a proper design in in all cases. And uh, also there's interest in minimizing maintenance, uh, often to the point of no maintenance. Like we just you know sell it and then that's it. And you know, uh, you, you may live, it wi live with it for 20 years in your home network, but <laughs> we're not going to update it. That's um, silly, I think. Um, and uh, it sort of ties into the life cycles of consumer goods, which is maybe more of this throwaway style and not, not so much maintenance and uh, long, long longevity of solutions. And maybe most importantly, externalities are not taken into account. So, you know, whatever you do and that may cause damage or something somewhere else, you don't need to worry about that because, you know, it doesn't show up on your sales or, or uh, your customer feedback. The, the damage is somewhere else. And that's bad. I, I think people are starting to realize this better after the Dyne attack and other things, but, but it's a huge issue. So, that's the... The, the situation, what can we do? Um, I have some basic steps and we'll, then we'll talk about the missing stuff in a, in a, in a bit. So the basic steps, technical stuff, uh, we need to have software update capability, obviously. We need to have some kind of uh, key management and pairing process to set up authorized parties uh, for interaction. And as part of that, there shall be no default passwords. Um, you know, admin, admin, uh, that's not, not good. Uh, <laughs> Probably some people still have that, but anyway. Um, and, and all connections need to be secure. Like I, I don't think there's a lot, lot of reason to do, do otherwise. And you also need to do system level security analysis. And we'll, we'll talk about some of that in more detail in a bit. And then there's some process things. Um, obviously we need to have as, as community and also as individual vendors and providers, we need to have sufficient expertise we need to be able to do testing, uh, security testing also, and evaluation of the security aspects of things uh, at many levels. Like when I do something, you know, is that secure? Did I miss something? But also if I buy something, like what, what's the impact of this if I plug it into my network? Um, systems need to be maintained and software regularly updated because attacks are just keep being found. So like, I mean, totally unrelated to your, your device, but if there's a new attack on some internet protocol or whatever, then, then you need to build some new code for that. Just the, just the way things, things are for other systems already. And we have to take that into account in, in IoT as well. And uh, of course, the key thing is availability of components from the ecosystem providers uh, with reasonable security so that we, like, you know, not every vendor of a gadget has to do everything, but they can import um, you know, the Riot thing or, or uh, the library or, or the tools that they need for their job. And uh, so your role is, is key here. Okay, but that, this is basically like uh, as of now or as of past. But I, I think there are actually some other issues that we need to talk about more seriously and give, given some changes in the environment. So if we encrypt all connections, are we done? That's, that's the question. And, uh, the obvious answer is no. Um, I should, by the way, mention that this is work that I've, I've done together with some colleagues from, uh, 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 from universities and uh, other, other companies, um, um, with uh, Stephen Farrell, uh, Ted Hardy, and Brian Trammell. So the reason that, that uh, the answer is no is that communication security is obviously only a small part of the overall security setup. And I, I mean, this isn't really news. Like everybody should understand this already, but um, I, I think there's some reasons why this is being forgotten, and there's some reasons why there's more of an issue now than there used to be. And also, we cannot always trust the parties we communicate with for many reasons, some of which we already talked about. 
Um, so um, at the IETF, there's this um, advice on you know how do you design a protocol and how do you document its security properties. And as part of that, they have something called a Internet Threat Model. It's an RFC 3552. Um, it basically says that uh, you know this is the th these are the threats that we should build for, and then some other threats that we don't worry so much about. And the thing that they want to build for, in according to this RFC, is that the attacker has full control of the communications medium. So you can't assume that your messages will be secret. You can't assume that they will not be intercepted or stopped, and so on. So you have to an, an, like answer how to deal with that. And the answer often is like encryption and authentication and integrity protection and so forth, communication security. But then this RFC went on to say that we assume that the end systems uh, engaging in a protocol exchange have not themselves been compromised. So it's basically as assuming that everybody like that, that proper players are acting pro like completely uh, correctly. And uh, of course, like this communication security part is absolutely necessary. There's, this is not an argument to not do communication security, even though some people would have that argument. But I think that's crazy. We should not have that argument. Um, the problem, however, is that we cannot really trust the other parties. That's just not current reality in the internet. It, it's you know very far from it. I'll give you some examples. So first of all, like um, the improvements that we made in the last five to ten years on the internet have shifted the bar. Like now, most com communications are encrypted. So obviously. If you're an attacker, you're going to look for some other venues to attack instead of trying to break the crypto, which is typically not possible or possi po uh, might not be possible for anybody, um, even the NSAs of the world. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of examples of that, obviously, like the criminals, but also like government surveillance agencies are looking uh, at this and they're focusing now not on like looking at your packets on, on the wire or on the wireless medium but they want to acquire the data in, in various other forms. Um, Australia has been trying to pass a law or passed some, some laws around this um, recently, and other, other um, countries are considering the same thing, and, uh, and many surveillance organizations are actually doing it. So, so they would, of course, go and fetch the data or you know, whatever information they feel they need in other ways. And if we actually do care about preventing wide-scale attacks on everybody's communications, then we have to do something about that. We also have the surveillance capitalism um, model of operation in the internet economy today. Uh, and this brings new risks because we have increased uh, the amount of data collection. We have increased the size of the databases that we uh, build. We have made the internet in many ways more um, centralized and putting things in fewer places. Um, so you have, you know, everything goes to Google or you know whatever the the, the thing is that that uh, that you're doing, and um, you know that that's a single point of failure or you know, p possible place for compromise of some sort. Either because you have you know, commercial interest that, well, you know, we have this data, why wouldn't we use it for, you know, advertisement targeting or let's sell this data. Lots of parties sell data and that's, um, that worries me actually quite a bit. Um, then we have this issue of interests of a communication par communicating party not aligned with, um, with other, uh, uh, other parties. So, uh, you as a user may be using something, but like you know, do you trust? I don't know Facebook. Um, you know, clearly they you know they have their own agenda and they they um, use their um, position in in the industry as as a way to essentially force the users to you know th this is the deal and and we will get all your data and you have very little to say about that actually. I mean, you can tweak some things, but you can't really tweak much. You, you could choose not, not to participate. That's essentially the choice. Um, and that, that, that's a problem as well. So uh, you want to be very careful where, like, you know, am I participating in this thing or not? And it's a different 
discussion for the general internet, but it's, it's also an interesting discussion for the IoT space. You also have situations where the network that you thought was um, like you know not not interestingly vulnerable, like this closed network, but it turns out to be attackable because you have that one node that is compromised, for instance, or or some other similar reason. Um, so some of my colleagues that I've been wor uh, working this with uh, created a, a poem version of this situation, uh, sort of a dark vision of uh, you know where. Everything's compromised and uh, crawling with uh, attackers, and uh, the future is na nasty. Um, yeah, I, maybe this is too, too dark for me or too, um, too depressing. I think we actually have a shot at improving things. But let, let's try to define this slightly better using sl slightly more accurate language. So. Uh, I wrote here that we assume that the application uh, managing a protocol exchange may have some parts, like the application could be distributed, may have some parts that are working for an adversary or at least misalignment of uh, uh, incentives. Even the whole application may be compromised in some fashion. Uh, you might be on a network with, where the other endpoints are hostile to the application or the, the user. And you, or you may be running in an environment that is entirely hostile to 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 the the purposes of you know whatever you you were trying to do, um, and um, I have some examples. Um, one example uh, is is tracking and browsers. Um, so many web pages collect information about users that uh, visit the web pages, and there's tons of tracking techniques and various kinds of co cookies and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, the amount of information that's uh, g generated from, from you doing something this in this manner is, is just immense. And, uh, of course, we would like to do something about this. Um, but you, I guess you also have to ask, like, who, who's with you? Like, I want to do something about this. I believe you want to do something about this. The end users in general want to would like this not to be an issue for them, um, but uh, who do you work with? And I, I'll just observe that browsers, for instance, are very different in their handling of um, various uh, tracking uh, attempts. Some, some browsers are, like, go out of their way to try to block as much as possible, and others are a little bit eager to allow that. You know, maybe because of the you know, incentives of who created those, those browsers or who they work with. Um, but that's a thing that you want to pay attention to. Another sort of recent discussion example is uh, what I call centralized DNS. And uh, some browsers are considering replacing DNS, uh, the, the classic DNS protocol to port 53, <laughs> with uh, HTTPS to uh, a sort of a common global provider of DNS resolution services. 111111 is uh, Cloudflare, uh, 8888 is uh, Google, and there's a few others. Um, and there's some, like, the, there's, there's multiple parts in this change. One is that, that you move things to a centralized party, the other one is that you encrypt the transaction. Okay? Um, and the encryption part prevents, like, outside parties, like a man in the middle from attacking this, this system. They can't see what's going on, they can't give you the wrong answer, and so forth, that's good. Um, the centralization aspect, if you believe that the local uh, uh, DNS is, you know, often vulnerable or uh, has some questionable practices like filtering or blocking or or something like that. Some governments do that, for instance, um, or f force their ISPs to do that. Uh, then you can prevent some of this happening because you go to a safe thing far away, but but it's it's going to give you the right answer. Um, on the other hand, if you think about this from a system perspective, um, you put like the today the DNS queries are sent to probably like, I don't know, 10 million different DNS servers around the world in different ISP networks and enterprise networks. You replace that with like everybody goes over here or maybe into two places. Is that a good trade-off? What are the implications of that? I think, uh, I think it's actually very dangerous because you would be creating this entity that would essentially see 
what's happening to a large number of users, potentially a majority of users in the internet. Um, essentially, like I mean, th what this would mean that every time user does something on the browser, the the entity would be informed of that because you need to make a DNS query, and, um, and it's not exactly every time, but but you get a very good picture of what's what's happening with the user, and you don't, of course you don't see what the user's communications are, but you see where, what the user is doing, or where it's it's going, and um, putting that in one place gives you an opportunity to do far more interesting commercial use of the information, and it's a you know <laughs> obvious target for governments to to uh, you know get the information from. And if I was a government or I was the NSA, I, I would say like. Oh my God! Uh, like the, the, these guys created exactly what we wished for Christmas. Like you know, one place, you know, one-stop shop for for surveillance. And I'm not saying that this is happening today. I I, I mean, I know some of the people who are running um, some of these services. They are very good people, and I, I trust uh, them a long way. Um, and they would not do any of this commercial stuff, at least. But of course, they are also not uh, immune to things like laws and. Government, government subpoenas and uh, and uh, surveillance uh, uh, orders and so forth. So that that's one example where I think this this trade-off is not necessarily making sense. And this is why we need to think about these kinds of issues much more than we have. I mean, this is a DNS example, maybe not super relevant for for Riot as such, but um, but it, it's it's a it's good model to think about things like do you, do you do you put everything, all the eggs in one basket, or do you have some uh, distribution and uh, heterogeneous networking going in the background? So what can we do? Um, some of us are talking about this. Uh, the you know the names that I showed earlier, all of them work at the or work, but they they are members of the IAB. Um, this is not an IAB activity as as such at at the moment, but it's sort of an IETF discussion, there's a mailing list. I'll, I'll give you the pointer in a, in a moment. Um, but it's a really hard problem. That's part of the reason why the original RFCs didn't really talk about this compromised notes much. We think there are some useful things we could do here, um, but plenty of this is also unclear or, or even like, you know, we can't do much about some aspect of this. There are some technical means. Like we could minimize data that we send, okay? Like not just willy-nilly send identifiers over to somebody just because we have a crypto con connection with them. Um, we could avoid creating centralized architectures. We'd rather opt for you know community, collaborative, um, federated systems. Um, we we can cut down the the sort of the impact of security leaks or security compromises better by. You know, separating keys in a technical sense, like perfect forward secrecy, is one example of that. Uh, I've been trying to put that into um, uh, 5G systems <laughs> for a while, and and sort of semi-succeeding, but not not entirely succeeding yet. So that's one one example. So where I've tried to make make an impact. And then uh, when you design something, you should not just think about like this is the use case and th this is how we defend it, but also like wh how could this be misused. Because a lot of these cases are com come from that. Um, and then we also plan, maybe in the future, to update the, the RFC on uh, what the Internet Threat Model is and provide an update to that. But that that's uh, further away. We'll, we'll be talking about this in, in uh, quite more depth uh, first. Um, yeah, so I, I have some potential guidelines. That could be taking us the sort of the first instruction or first approximation of what should we do. Um, and the first one is consider first principles when protecting information. And 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 this comes from what I see often as a, like a, you know, let's just follow what those other guys did um, approach to engineering. Like, well, those guys used TLS. Why don't we just use TLS and our security problem is solved? No, you can't do that. Like, I mean, it could be a perfectly good answer. But you actually have to think about like what the parties are, you know, who should have the information, who should not. Sometimes you want to actually do end-to-end -end protection uh, via other parties, so you have a transport connection from A to B and then B to C. Um, now, if you do TLS between A and B and, and and B and C, it doesn't help you to protect information from B. 
if, if that if if B is a potential you know party that would be leaking information, then you you might not want to do that, or you might want to do TLS and something else. Uh, you want to minimize information passed to others, as I said earlier. Um, also, minimizing the passing of control functions to others. And now this is, I think, very interesting for, for the IoT crowd here. Um, you know, who, who's in control of your home network or, or your factory network? We really need to think about that. I think the, at least in the factory case, people, are the customers of our systems are, are really thinking about that hard. So we better have good, good answers. And uh, finally, avoid, avoid centralized resources, as, as discussed with this. DNS and other examples. Uh, for, for IoT, um, I, I, I guess the basic thing is that system security analysis is still needed. Um, you want to think about, because you typically have like multiple components, not just the IoT device and the user, but it's like gateway and cloud component and another cloud component and a, a, you know, some other thing over there. So you want to analyze what, which ones of those um, might be weak points, um, deal with situations that might result um, if, if you have compromised devices or compromised gateways. Um, think very hard what the cloud components should be, like who's in control of that. Uh, like the example where the browsers might or might not be working for you. Um, you know, is your IoT application or IoT cloud component working for you? Or is it working for somebody else? Does it exist because it's gonna you know, suck data out of your system and you know, sell it? Sometimes it is, so you know, be careful about that. Uh, yeah, so also in, ensure that uh, systems can be configured to work with whatever desired gateway or cloud component or data storage that, that you have. That's like a really, uh, crucial freedom issue that I am free to you know, put this thing or the, put the data from this thing into that system and not be bound to a particular manufacturer or, or a platform. So we need community and distributed solutions. That's probably work for you. Uh, we need to stay in control of what software sources are used for updates. Um, and I mentioned this transport layer example already. So maybe the fine solution for most cases, but might not be enough in a lot of cases. Product, consider producting data end to end. And you know, use data object security. OSCORE is one example here. I believe there's some work on OSCORE going on in, in, the, in your community. That's great. And um, yeah, I have some additional pointers. There's a couple of drafts at the IETF. There's a mailing list that you can you can join if you're interested in the topic. And um, yeah, I, I think I'm coming to the end of time and uh, have a summary here. Just uh, anything else. Um, so encryption alone cannot provide the full security solution that we all need. There are significant threats around compromised nodes, centralized solutions, and parties whose interests do not align with yours. Um, and I believe the IoT systems in particular are prone to this, these issues. And we need to stay in control of our, you know, wh where we connect to and what our devices do. Um, we need to secure our data, not just the uh, connections. And uh, I think we need to be the solution for some of this. We, we the riot or the IoT ecosystem more generally. So that's it. Um, I think we can have some discussion if we have time, I'm sure, um, or questions. was designed at Alto. Oh yeah, it's, it works. It's too loud. <laughs> okay. So who, who wants first? Uh, okay, Pekka. Yeah, in a, in a previous conference, <laughs> I, I got hit by, with that in the <laughs> head. You know, not very good with you know, sports. Right, so, um, so I'm Pekka Nikander from Alto. Uh, so Yari, you mentioned several times that we shouldn't go centralized. And you mentioned federation, you mentioned distribution. 
Uh, you didn't use the word decentralized. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Um, but what's your view? So if we shouldn't be centralized, what way we should go? So, so first of all, it was not intentional to like, I, I mean, in, in general, I'm pointing out a problem and, and then I'm very much hand waving what the solutions are and then you and others need to come up with a decentralized or otherwise solution. So I don't know, what do you think? What, what, what should we do to, to solve this? Oops. I'll come back. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. So, um, I think we should do multi go multiple paths in parallel. So, so basically from the system point of view, if we try to have a single solution which works for all, it's, it becomes a point of failure itself, however we, however we build it. So um, I think in many business cases, federation is probably a nice way to go because you don't really need to change the existing systems that much. You don't really need to build maybe a layer on the top of them, but you just see that you create a level of interoperability using, using different means and different ways to get federation. When going into protocol design, um, I think there are lots of interesting things going on how to go beyond Byzantine consensus. So for example, how to use shards and, and create the Byzantine consensus that scales with shards. There are things like the IOTA tangle and, and in general the tangle kind of ways of storing information where you are basically sourcing the ground for signing things in, in different ways where you don't necessarily need to trust fully what you are signing because you are not saying that, okay, I trust this information. You're just saying that, okay, I'm signing this information because I was asked to sign it. So that, the, and, and then it's, it's basically the crowd who creates the trust on the top of that. A little bit like magic, but not quite. So um, there are various things, and I think this is a very nice active area of research where basically things like distributed ledgers, weak consensus protocols, and new kinds of cryptography are um, meeting. I'm not a real expert there. There are others, maybe even in this room, but I think it's a, worth, it's a space worth looking at. Thank you, Victor. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Mohit uh, from, from Ericsson as well. Uh, so, Yari, uh, you say, we should not centralize, so does that mean we should get ri rid of EAP, which kind of works on a, on a AAA server? And if we, if we go down the path, and, and you have been co-author on, on many EAP RFCs, so if we go down the path, everything should be distributed and, and nothing should be centralized, I think it would make security worse in many cases because it's so much easier to do access control authorization on a server rather than having shared secrets in, in, in different networks. And uh, sure, sure, in, 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 in the case of DNS, I understand that it, it centralize, centralizes, uh, but, but DNS still has a server. It's just that this server is now being run by, by one party rather than having millions of servers. So I don't think we are against having servers and centralization, or, or we are not against having servers as long as there are many servers and, and not, not, not a single party running them. Yeah, Mohit, that, that, that's a good question. I, I think there's though, uh, like, uh, it's, it's not black and white because you have this, uh, like, take the DNS example, uh, for, for instance, you have, you today, you know, or the, the traditional way of doing DNS, you have a client and a server, and you ask things from the server, and, and if, you know, the server doesn't have an answer, then you go further to the actual authority to the server. That's, you know, you could call that centralization, but that was not the kind of centralization that I was talking about. That's still the 10, 10 million different servers around the world and sort of collaborating, and, and you ask the, the locally centralized server for stuff. Uh, but I was talking about this hugely centralized version where everybody goes to, you know, did we really need to tell even that this information to Google kind of thing? Um, so, yep. so there's a difference there, I think. And so Maybe. I, I think we still are, <laughs> okay with like authentication protocols going to an authentication server, as long as there's more than one authentication server right. in the world. Right, uh, Maybe also an anecdote, having a server means that I have less things to update. 
right? If, if I have a server and many devices which are simpler, then I have fewer things to, to update and fewer things which will have security problems and I, my cycle of updating can be much, much, much faster. So I think the, the, the message here should not be that we are against servers in, in general, but we are against servers being run by like one or two large corporations. That's right, thank you. Oh. Hey, working some Gator here. Um, for me, what if going for decentralization is a good pass because then you say you give your data to anybody that may not know how to handle it. Meaning, if he doesn't know how to store, maybe you don't. You give me the solution for storing safely by default, and it pushes toward you don't. You shouldn't trust where the data is, and by going that pass, you remove the power on the endpoint by saying. You have my data, but it's encrypted anyway. Maybe you know why you get it in the morning, but you know, don't know what it is. And as it's in a, a dangerous path, you need to take measure that it's not dangerous anymore. And let me give some solution at least for this. Yeah, I mean, you, you make a good point. Uh, and uh, of course, like this, this class of solutions where, where you, know, you work with a centralized party but, but you ensure that they can't use your information by encrypting it, for instance. That, that, that's one, one type of approach that we can use here. Ah. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, um, you talked about like uh, shorter life cycles of products uh, being a cause for some of IoT security issues in, in in IoT, do you think that uh, a uh, those uh, life cycles are significantly shorter than in other parts of uh, IT industry? And b, do you think uh, uh, how, you know how how should we um, how, what's the future here? Uh, are, are these cycles are going to change? Uh, well, I, I I don't think we can change the cycles of like consumer goods in general. I mean that's not in. It's not our role to fix that. Um, that might be a different problem, but uh, but I, what, what I simply meant that that the uh, consumer goods uh, life cycle situation will dictate some things. Like you know, I don't know if you have some IoT thingy in your shoes. Well, your shoes are not going to live forever, like a year or two or whatever, uh, depending how you use them. And so uh, you know, the the expectation is not that that you have to maintain it a lot. And this leads the you know, whoever is providing those shoes to think, well, I can, you know, I don't have to worry about maintenance, I don't have to update. Um, and and if, if, if this kind of attitude spreads also into areas where you actually would have to have like maintenance, like, I don't know, something in your house could live easily 20 years, um, then, then that's bad. Oops. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jan Neumann from a company called Control Things. Um, um, I have a question related to the public key inf uh, infrastructure, um, uh, these uh, certificates and uh, people signing them, companies signing them. Do you see, uh, w how, how do you see the future of that? Because it's, that's also a very important technology being used for uh, in everyday life. Everybody here certainly uses it or are dependent. And uh, it's, a, it's a way to prevent man in the middle attacks. But, but it, it has also the risk that, that uh, um, an untrusted party uh, is, enters the chain. Do you, do you see any alternative to that? It's a really good question. I don't really have a good answer, at least not a good alternative that you're asked for. But, uh, but it, it, it's actually a big problem. And it's also a sort of an unexpected thing that people are thinking that, well, because you know, I have a connection to that guy and, and they have the right certificate, then you know, they really are the party. But there are these things like this, let's encrypt you know, all for it's all good things that it has done to the world. It also an interesting uh, attack vector that you can, uh, like if, if you manage to get somebody offline and, and hijack their, their um, uh, route, for instance, for, for a moment, and, um, and then, then you pretend to be them, you can basically ask for a Let's Encrypt certificate by, you know, because Let's Encrypt will be able to see that, ah, if I go to that website, you know, here's the file that I requested to put there, and then it is there, therefore I will give them a certificate. Now you have a certificate uh, for this domain, and um, uh, 
and, and then you can you know, use that for various kinds of other attacks. So it, it's, it's even more brittle than, than people actually think. But the good thing with this uh, cert infrastructure, however, is that at least we have like multiple providers. That, that, that's one good thing that, that, that it, it is there. And, and there's some maintenance of, of the lists and tracking of like who's a reliable party by the browser vendors, for instance. So, but I, yeah, it, it's a huge problem. I, I don't see an easy fix. Well, <clears throat> I, I'd like to share my point on this uh, uh, topic because if we're talking about uh, this third party uh, that want to enter our chain of trust, uh, let's give names to things like, for example, uh, Microsoft uh, IoT Azure. Uh, they tend to try to control your entire fleet in a way that they can sell you services on top of that just because they can provide uh, some kind of access separation for you. So. Probably the solution here is own your, get your own certificates, uh, be the owner of your own keys when you do uh, these kind of operations, and uh, as, as you said, uh, absolutely uh, rely on more than just one provider for, for things. But we, I think there is uh, uh, an important call for action to stay away from uh, centralized uh, control of chain of trust uh, from uh, service providers, especially if those service providers uh, have a well-known track for uh, trying to own, uh, to, to get ownership on your own products and technologies. Uh, that's uh, my point. Right, or at least have requirements that you can you know, access and get hold of you know, whatever keys and so on. Because you have also some issues with, like if you try to put your employees or student admins to do stuff, that you know, from a CEO perspective of in a company, like I can pay this, the Azure admin, or I can pay Microsoft, or I can pay this third party, and and all of them have some issues, but set some requirements. So you were mentioning uh, you know, increased use of uh, of uh, certificates and uh, let's encrypt that. Yeah, it can have its uh, potential flaws, but even. Uh, and, and on the same and on the same line of uh, centralization or distribution, uh, without going to let's encrypt, uh, you have, for example, in, in anybody in their computer, uh, a long list of uh, certificate authorities because you know the the it's the the, the task of uh, producing certificates is decentralized, but in a in a kind of in a wrong way because then you look at at your list of approved CAs and there are many ones from like. Let's say sketchy countries, like not to mention anyone in particular, but you know, from countries where you know the the, the CA will be like easily coerced by the government. So like, it's, it's an instance, I guess, where decentralization, uh, too much of it is uh, uh, as bad as too much. Uh, sorry, uh, as too little. Yeah, and that, that, that's a good point as well. And uh, another example of you know your browser is not only working for you, but it's also working with all kinds of other other um, stakeholders. Um, so you know they, they also need to sell to other countries, and therefore they may you know it, it's a complicated model. Okay, so we have the last question here. Oop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for interesting presentation. And uh, if you talk about IoT, um, what do you think about uh, hardware security? Yeah, I mean uh, attacks uh, like uh, Spectre or Meltdown. Yeah, if attacker can exploitation uh, such vulnerabilities, uh, uh, he can uh, take a huge privilege. Yeah, why we don't talk about hardware security? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's also a huge issue. Uh, for, for me, it sort of went uh, under the uh, you know headline of uh, compromised nodes. That there are many ways of. I mean, that's one reason. Like, even if we have like this, this room here, and uh, the building is sealed, and then there's a fence around us, and everything's locked down. But you know, as the, all, all it takes is you know some CPU bug that can can be. Uh, misused by somebody, and and then you have a compromised node. So I, I, you know, there's lots of detail there, lots of attacks to worry about. Uh, the end level effect, however, is is largely the same. That you might may have compromised entities in your network, even if you configured them yourself. Hello, uh, Pekka from Forum Virium Helsinki, uh, Helsinki City Development Company, and we're working a lot of 
IoT devices with uh, involved with the citizen measurements, let's say so. But uh, I'm not asking a question, but I'm uh, bringing out the status of uh, uh, a little bit about Helsinki. You know that we have a fabulous open data available for businesses to, to make applications, but meanwhile we're also testing uh, different IoT devices and platforms with companies and with network operators to make city more flexible and more functional. But anyway, uh, we have faced a new kind of uh, questions also. You mentioned a lot of the hacking and government intrusion in their, in their presentation, but meanwhile the GDPR issues are, are facing also this. IoT devices, for example, if we're measuring air quality with the portable sensors, the location information is kind of scientifically needed, but uh, from the citizen wave, you don't necessarily want to share your bus trip or bus trip or whatever. So this brings new kind of uh, approaches also for this handshaking or uh, server centralized authentication issues and how to neutralize these kind of things and who wants to know where you are. So I, I think the, what we're doing, we, we're inviting companies for innovation companies, uh, innovation competitions, and now next year is starting a pretty big innovation comp competition for, for uh, IoT air quality. And uh, about greetings from, uh, from other countries, I was last week in Russia. And uh, they explained in uh, pretty details how they are doing uh, some government IoT things. And the thing is that they don't have so much money for doing that. So only possible aggregators now are telcos in there. So somebody is saying it's not useful to put data in there, but I think some data is better than zero. Thanks. So thank you very much. Let's thank Yari and all the questioners again.